Oh, I thank the organizers, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Sriram, uh, we already celebrated a bit yesterday, but really, uh, congratulations. Xia Xing Shi, who did most of his work, uh, could not come because of a great friendship between uh, India and China. You know, he's suffering some hiccups. Uh, but he sends his regards. And if you're patient enough, you'll know what's running up in the background here. It's about 2D active crystals. And um, in this audience, I don't have to tell you about active matter. And it's no surprise that, you know, eventually some people would have think about active, uh, what's the active next thing I can do, so active crystals. Uh, and indeed, we are not the first. It's because we saw some papers that we were, say, intrigued by that we went into this. Um, and uh, 2D crystals in equilibrium are famous because of the, uh, I would say, tour de force. Tour de force, how do you say this in pseudo-English? <laughs> of KTH and Weiss, of these gentlemen here, Costal de Sfales, Harper, Nelson, and Young, in three or four or five papers. <laughs> and probably Berezinski should be there also because, you know, we want to be fair. And but anyway, uh, so this acronym stuck. Uh, yeah, fascination of theorists for KTHNY and some of the theorists in the room are old enough probably to have been fascinated by, by KTHNY um, and a fashion to look at anything active. So anyway, uh, this is not just because uh, we want to play active games on, uh, on a new system that we know of in equilibrium. Uh, recently, this, uh, this is supposed to be moving, maybe. Uh, this has got a lot of press recently. Ah, yeah, I'm not in full screen, so I'm not sure what, what's going to, okay. Uh, but anyway, what I want to look at is not the global rotation. It's, it's the way that these uh, starfish embryos, in fact, organize themselves on the surface in a crystalline arrangement. Bacteria do this. Various kinds of spinners do this. Many models do this. And here we're interested in, not in this in particular, not in anything chiral, which is also very interesting. And you might ask a question of what happens in a chiral case. But uh, what we are interested in is uh, a more general, in some sense, problem, the stability of 2D crystals made of active particles of some sort, any sort, basically, um, that interact locally, typically by repulsive forces, uh, without a boundary, so we, so we don't not interested in edge modes or whatever, or things like that, or global modes, global rotation. And previous works have done this, and made of crystals are made of ABPs, or ABPs I think everybody knows, active Brownian particles are particles that are basically, uh, when free, perform persistent random walk. So they have a persistence of some intrinsic axis. And usually people consider these particles to be interacting by pairwise repulsive forces. Uh, and these papers concluded that the famous KTHNY scenario, which I will talk to you about, uh, holds, or even some of them assumed it to be true in the context of active particles, which, of course, has no reason to be because this is heavily relying on equilibrium ideas. So today we revisit this problem, and, uh, and I'll show you that indeed uh, the two active crystals are very different from. Uh, so that, that thing is. What we are getting to, this is a deformation field. So we have, imagine, a perfect crystal. And this thing has deformed enough uh, without creating defects. So you can measure the deformation, or define the deformation field with respect to the initial perfect conditions, positions. And the uh, contour lines, this one is labeled three, meaning that locally here, that the color is the orientation of this uh, displacement vector, deformation vector. And the intensity marked here by the intensity of the color, so here it's three, beyond three, particles have been displaced by more than three, that is, steps. Without the crystal uh, melting, essentially, because there are no, no defects. Also, this is what we want to see and understand. Okay, the outline is, uh, so uh, very basic things about the KTHNY theory and then what we did in simple crystals and how we understand it at some theoretical level. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I forget that I can scroll through here. So a 2D crystal is an arrangement of particles which shows 
why is that long range only positional order in the presence of fluctuations, any temperature? So that's in equilibrium now or now. But long range bond order. So if you look at the way the, in, a, in triangular crystal, the bonds are arranged, they form an exotic phase. This exotic order is long range even at finite temperature below melting. So definition of a 2D crystal for E for today will be both quasi long range positional order and long range bond order. Uh, in top of this, on top of this, you can have point defects, uh, interstitials, vacancies, and pairs of dislocations, which, which will remain bounded, uh, and the melting is decided or defined by the unbinding of a pair of dislocations. That's the first uh, result of KTHNY, but basically KTHNY is the melting of 2D crystals, which are defined like this in equilibrium can, can proceed in two steps. Doesn't have to, like for a, two continuous transitions of a KT type. Of course, it could be discontinuous transitions, so that's not what we're talking about. So uh, a first transition is the quasi long range positional order becomes short order, short range, and the long range bound order becomes quasi long range. And that's typically uh, an exotic phase in the case of a triangular crystal. Uh, that you go from the crystal to this exotic phase by unbinding of these pairs of dislocation which are thermally activated. Okay. And this exotic phase finally goes into the liquid phase where both orders, even bond order becomes short range through another KT transition. And that is usually uh, linked or is linked to the unbinding of a dislocation into a pair of disclination. And there is a picture which I stole from a recent paper by Di Gregorio et al. here, where it's pictorially uh, summarizing this. So this is the solid the crystal phase, where you have here a pair of dislocations which stays bounded. So the exotic order and crystalline order, uh, crystalline order is only quasi long range and exotic order is truly long range here. This has unbounded, you have a free dis dislocation in the exotic phase still maintain quasi long range exotic order and here a free disclination that is basically influencing the whole thing and breaking any order okay all right so KTHNY theory is not just uh, qualitative like this it has quantitative predictions in particular um, the exponents and scaling laws characterizing the transitions are known but very very hard to, to observe even numerically in fact uh, something that is usually also uh, adopted as a test of a, tr of a theory is that they provide upper bounds for the decay exponents of this quasi long range order phase. So in the crystal phase, positional order decays algebraically with an exponent which grows at temperature, with temperature. And when the exponent reaches one third, typically in usual crystals, then it is melting. So there is a bound on the exponent uh, preceding at melting point, at the melting point, okay? Uh, so which means that the, uh, yes, I say this, this uh, eta exponent is, uh, formally it's between one fourth and one third, but there, are, there is a bound and usually it is one third, okay? So the transitions can be discontinuous, as I said, and it can even be direct melting, but that's not the point here. So now the question is, what are these bond, bonds? I mean, oh, there's something else here, something else here about the exponents. Uh, within linear theory, linear elastic theory, you can, uh, spin wave fluctuations calculation, easy calculation gives you an, exp an expression for the exponent eta here as a function of the uh, so-called Lamy coefficients, the elastic coefficients of the crystal. And these are well, temperature and uh, inverse reciprocal vector for the lattice. And melting occurs roughly when entropy and elastic energy or dislocation are balanced. That gives you an ever relationship here. Now equate, uh, you know, uh, equating, putting in the KBT in here, etc., gives you this bound for eta. So eta is typically given by this expression as a function of the uh, Lamy coefficients. And the, if you have a good eye, you can see that this cannot be uh, larger than one third. Okay, now the question is what happens, keep going to my computer, in the case of active crystals. So here, is the, 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 the model on which we did most of the numerics, but uh, 
there is a simpler case that I will maybe talk about later, but this is easier for us to live with. These are basically uh, ABPs, so they move uh, the self-propulsion force at zero here uh, around theta i. Theta i is having rotational diffusion. That's ABPs, okay? Plus here, um, sort of a very simple uh, harmonic repulsion pairwise within some distance uh, d zero. And here's an extra ex ingredient, a weak uh, local alignment of the polarities, but believe me, this is not truly necessary for what I'm showing you. Uh, it's just that numerically this makes our life much easier, as I said already. So this kappa is small. And when kappa is large, strong alignment between particles, you do have regimes where all the polarities uh, align and the crystal can flow. And actually it's unstable, but I won't talk about this. Uh, but we are here in the sort of low kappa regime where, uh, where alignment is not strong enough to produce any kind of polar order within the crystal. So it's really short, very, very short range. And indeed, uh, what, I, what I show you can also happen in, for harder potentials without uh, any alignment. So if we are going to look at inside the crystal phase here, so basically you see that there is a crystal phase defined as we will see next by these uh, correlation functions, uh, followed by an exotic phase and a liquid. So you might say uh, qualitatively where well, I'm fine with KTH and Y, uh, and we may be in fact. And quantitatively, this is another, another question. Here is a point taken in the middle of a phase diagram, the crystal phase of a phase diagram I showed you. So here you see the positional order correlation functions and function of uh, distance here in log log scales. Um, this is a nice correlation function that does not oscillate, so it, it gives you a clear signal. And you see that for various system sizes up to this fairly large one here, you built up a power law, which is very, very clean, and has exponent here in this case 0.68. So we are way beyond this one third bound already. Okay. Whereas the, the bound order correlation function, G6 of R, which measures the correlations between local phi 6 ordering, uh, is after some crossover scale, absolutely long range. Okay, so that's a crystal. There are no defects in this case to be seen. And the exponent is way beyond one third. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, other data like this. So now if you vary, you fix the self-proportion, well, let's start here on the right-hand side. If you look as a function of a self-proportion for squared, which you could interpret, sorry, I'm coming back to the equations as some kind of noise, given that the orientations are varying very widely and in a disordered manner, this could be interpreted as some noise or related to positional diffusion, maybe. Uh, this idea is a good idea. He has a function of S0 squared, which would be like a temperature. You see that the exponent goes linearly at a fixed, fixed kappa, kappa is the alignment constant, but anyway, so this is, an indication that S0 squared is like a temperature, okay? First indication. As a function of kappa, you see that the exponent can take values uh, pretty much as close to two as you wish. In fact, beyond two, you cannot, you cannot define this exponent because you don't have a Bragg peak in the, in the structure function. Displacement of individual atoms are larger than the lattice steps, so you, you're in trouble. So we'll come back to this later. And so we have this very large eta values, no problem. The indication that S0 squared can be seen or the polarity field S can be seen as a, an effective temperature field with space-time correlations, okay? And now we look at uh, the spatial spectrum of this S field, so the polarities, if you want. Uh, that confirm that this at, at, at no Alignment, this is flat, lack in equilibrium, but this is not equilibrium because you still have time correlations. But as you increase kappa, you see that uh, the plateau here goes up and up and up. That's a measure in, in some sense of the, of the uh, effective temperature TS I was talking of TS, S like whatever S, uh, increasing with kappa. Uh, whereas at, uh, this is only at small k, at large k, not much happens. So you tempted to define 
a large scale effective temperature which grows with S0 and grows with kappa. Okay, so within linear elastic theory, the displacement field U, displacement of each particle with respect to the perfect initial crystal is governed by something like this in equilibrium where S is a noise. Okay, here we think we can describe this, our active system by this S equation here. So it relaxes very fast, zero. This is due to the local alignment uh, thing, but it can go away also if you don't have alignment. And here is a, is a real noise here, okay? Uh, what do we do with this? We can calculate within this linear elastic theory, we can calculate the spectrum of the displacement field U, okay, uh, which is a very easy thing to do. Uh, we, see, we, we see spectra like this numerically for U with a K to the minus two behavior at small K and a K to the minus six behavior at large K as in our calculations in the small K limit the prefactor of the one over k squared law is like this. And here you recognize quantities that, or you have, you have to tell me, that are very similar to equilibrium, except that the temperature T of equilibrium, of the equilibrium case has been replaced by this Ts, which has the S0 squared, the rotational diffusion constant, and some coefficient A squared, which is not the lattice step here, it's the prefactor of the S0 squared behavior. Uh, so Rho, rho, rho is the uh, global density. It's just the number. Yeah, it's a number, number density. Number density. And lambda and mu have the classic lambdas and mu's. A is the prefactor of this, uh, of these slopes here, which is measured this way. I mean, this is in collapse with, uh, so A is not the lattice step. Lattice step is L0, it appears somewhere, but it disappeared now. Uh, The, the crossover is uh, this quantity we call K star, uh, which we measure. Uh, it is in the theory. I mean, we, we, it, it can be, well, I, I guess it could be extracted from the full calculation of the spectrum, but we did not even bother. But we have the answer somewhere. Yes, it, be, it can be whatever you want, depending on parameters. But yeah, lattice type, lattice. Uh, on the row spectra, the lattice is around here, uh, and the crossover you see varies. Okay, so we collapse the spectra using a K star, which is this crossover, and a C star for the uh, amplitude here. We collapse very, very nicely. Okay, and we can use these um, we can use these coefficients to recalculate, so to speak, eta. You can express the exponent eta uh, as a function of these two extract, uh, quantities extracted from the spectra, the same reciprocal constant and a pi factor. When we do this from the U spectra, we have the uh, blue values of eta in this graph here. And whereas in red, we have the etas measured from direct uh, fits of the correlation function in real space. So the blue, the red curve has to stop at two because then you cannot define the exponent anymore. But that quantity here can go anywhere. Here, I think this point is 14, something like this, doesn't matter. Um, so we can indeed go even beyond the, the crystal remains a crystal in the sense of Poisson orange positional order and true bound order for deformations which are arbitrarily large compared to the lattice steps, it seems. So very, very deformable. And we see this in many cases, okay. Um, what else is there? Ah, there's a movie now of what's happening in this uh, extreme case where the exponent, so to speak, uh, is 14. This is the uh, exotic Magnitude of the exact local exotic order, very, very boring and short range correlated and very, uh, I mean, short range fluctuations and strongly correlated near one. Uh, here this is the displacement field, which again is colored by orientation and intensity is magnitude of displacement, which reaches values beyond three in this case. Of course, it gets worse if you take 
larger systems. This is already pretty large one. Um, and so you have a perfect crystal order without defects here. All right. Now, trying to understand this better, so we have argued for and we showed evidence for an effective large scale elastic, large scale temperature describing the elastic deformations. That's this TS thing from the measure of the spectra. And we can measure it very precisely, and it has a clean definition in the, large, in the small scale limit, large scale limit. Now we turn to the long range bond order for which in equilibrium some things are known. If you, if you open the book by uh, Carda, for example, you will read that the asymptotic value of the um, bond order, that's the bond order correlation function, the one that decays into a plateau and then plateaus, the value at, of this plateau uh, it's at infinite distance, typically uh, uh, is, well, is defined like this. And in equilibrium, it decreases exponentially with temperature. Okay, it's a simple argument, which I don't reproduce here. We do observe this. We observe that minus log of, or log of G6 infinity goes like S0 squared. S0 squared is more or less our tentative temperature. So now we are, want to define another effective temperature, so-called bound order temperature, by just having this S0 squared factor and a reduced temperature T6 here, depending on our other parameters. Okay, now you see, first of all, I, I, I skipped this graph, but we do see this. And here you see graphs of minus log of this G6 infinity value as a function of S0 squared in log log. But all the slopes here, all the straight lines here have slope one. So this is really linear behavior. This is for many values, many different values of kappa and dr. So whatever we do, we have this behavior. Indeed, like in equilibrium. So now we take the prefactors of all these linear uh, straight lines here. Uh, put it in some T6, okay? When we take the rotational diffusion constant to infinity, we go to equilibrium, to equilibrium harmonic crystal, because the rotational diffusion is so fast that, you know, and you can forget about everything else. In this limit, we can adjust the prefactor T6 here and the prefactor TS of the TS we have to be the, to be the same and equal to the nominal thermodynamic, thermal temperature in equilibrium. And now we can look at what happens, sorry, it's here. So we have TS equals this in equilibrium. So this, we can define a little TS, which is a prefab, the, well, the dr over 2a squared here, okay? And we can adjust TS and T6 so that they coincide in equilibrium and coincide with thermal temperature, I mean, times at zero squared. Time, yeah, time the temperature, okay. And now we can see how these uh, reduced temperatures, so to speak, reduced effective temperatures behave as you, for example, vary here at zero uh, alignment, in fact, vary with the, the rotational diffusion constant. So equilibrium is here at, you know, it's a log-log scale again here. The two temperatures remain the same, but then depart from each other. And what we see is that indeed, the, as expected, the large scale effective temperature for elastic uh, modes is larger, becomes larger than the bound order temperature. If now you work at fixed dr equals one here, and you vary kappa, you see that, again, the uh, elastic temperature at large scale is larger, but gets larger, much, much and much larger, and the, this is a log scale here, uh, than the bound temperature, which doesn't do much. So in some sense, you have a picture, if you believe in these two effective temperatures, you have a, a bond order is very local fluctuations. It, not much happens if you increase activity to it. On the other hand, the large scale is at elastic effective temperature goes super high. And you could argue that the nucleation and unbinding of pairs of dislocation, which marks melting still, is, is governed by something related to TS and not to T. To T6, sorry, the bound order temperature, and not to Ts, okay, which explains, so, so you know, you, you may have a limit here for T6 where this is near melting now here. So melting will be around here when, it, when this blue line reaches this a, so, a small value here. But at the same time, the effective temperature for elastic deformations is very, very much larger, hence the very large exponents, very strong 
fluctuations, deformations without melting. Okay. So, a summary, and I, if I have a bit of time, I'll show you some, a few other things, but a summary right now. So, the active crystals that I showed new and many others sustain strong spontaneous deformations without melting. The KTH and Y bounds do not apply. Um, we have a two temperature picture of how we understand this. Alignment is not crucial. I have here, I'm going to flash it to you. This is a WCA active crystal. So without alignment, it shows the same things. You have to believe me. And the, here, the example of the exponent is uh, 0.58 in this case. But anyway, so it happens without alignment, in case you're really worried about this. Similar results obtained with systems without alignment. With chirality, for passive crystals in an active bath, now you, you take a passive crystal, and you have active particles of bumping into it. So this just, and that does the same thing. Um, and even an XY model with time correlated noise, if you're interested. So the idea here is that the key ingredient is a persistent, in the time persistence of the perturbations of that, that affect the particles of a crystal. And I'll show you maybe the, the active bath thing. This is one case where eta is near one here. A very, we have much better data now on this. But, and uh, XY model with a einstein ullenbeck noise here. You can go beyond the one fourth limit of KT transition super easily without any unbinding of dislocations. Uh, well, enough. Thank you so much. Back to the concluding slide. Ah, and the key problem before Sriram asks the question is what is the transition? <laughs> and uh, we're working on this, but. Uh, So I have a question about the last uh, thing that you just flashed on yep. XY model yep. time correlated noise. So the two temperature picture I understand when there's two fields uh, yeah. which may be related but nonetheless they're different of bond orientation and translation. Over here, what's the where's the two temperatures? Uh, you still have something happening with defects here. So you defects know. are present over here. Yeah, yeah. You, you, the noise nucleus defects, okay. uh, they're, they're, when you see them, they're pairs of dislocation yes. and they're bound. Even here, where in this case, it's 0 0.6 the exponent, you do see from time to time clearly. Uh, they don't unbind. Uh, long range, uh, well, well, there's no, well, I mean, this is only quasi long range, yeah. but uh, I, this is only, you have to trust me that this is equally clean data as what you've seen before. And um, so that's it. You know, we, we have basically just put persistence in time. Yes. And that's enough. And you go beyond. Now, we are working on what is a transition. Mm -hmm. And it, this is very hard <laughs> numerically. And theoretically, what we, can, what we can see for now is that the unbinding is still what will mark the, trans, the, yes. mark the transition. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a tautological in some sense. But the KT scaling maybe change, and, but that's very delicate. So. Have you all measured the uh, correlation? Um, so this is for the angle-angle correlation. That's how this eta is obtained. What if you measure the um, correlation of the charge density of the defects, the density-density correlation of yeah, the defects? Yeah, so that, that we it, haven't done. Yeah, now we're, we're it, somehow we find it easier to, to look at the transition in the crystal uh, because uh, we don't quite understand this very well, but we have better statistics on, on defects on the crystal phase. You know, okay. we, we see very near melting in the case I showed you before, when uh, you had these curves. Let me go to the very beginning, not too far, not too many slides. Here, melting is marked by these blue lines, uh, defined roughly by where we see unbinding. So when you are nearby, uh, you see Pairs of dislocations, they do see, they do appear. Um, we can follow them. And some points clearly they unbind. 
So we are trying we are trying to get good statistics on this. And in spite of what some people write in papers they, that are published, it's super hard to do this cleanly. And I think we have good ideas to do this. When we do this, we are polluted by interstitials coming in. It gets even more complicated. So the, the cleanest data we have indicate that uh, the best scaling that we have of this data is that the uh, there's a 0.37 exponent in the KT theory. That would be changed by enough that we can be reasonably confident. But we are super, super cautious about this. But in these simple cases, the transition is still marked by the unbinding. And the scaling might be, may be changed. Yeah, um, I was trying to understand something. I'm, I'm probably just muddle-headed. Uh, but when you get a very large eta, not in, not in yeah. the XY model, yes. but in the, in the crystal, even the quasi bright peaks go away completely, yeah. Yeah. right? There, so is, you... there is an extra slide for you, Sriram. Here. Yeah. So the structure factor, Yeah. Uh, if you look, this is the case with the exponent uh, 14, so to speak, I think. Right, some, right. Yeah, this is, this is it, yeah. Uh, if yeah, you look, so. If you look at this peak, right. it's not a peak. It's a broad, flat-ish region in orange here. Right. Uh, which does not have eta minus two like it has here in the blue, the blue case is right. a very small. So there isn't, there's no longer a singularity at Q, equal, Q equals no. G for each, no. right? Yeah. So structurally, how do we say that it's different from a crystal? Don't if we, we have, structurally, how do we say that it's different from a hexatic? Uh, this is not exotic, this is crystal. That's what I'm saying. Structurally, how do we say that it's different from a hexatic uh, the, when the peaks have become blobs? The, I mean, they're not I mean, even I, singular. I, I give you my definition. The, yeah. the, the positional order decays as a, as a power law, a very sharp power law. And the bound order is strictly flat. I mean, you know, they, you can always fit an exponent, but you'll fit 0 0.000 and maybe negative, whatever. So um, it's, it's flat. So that's my definition, which is usually uh, what people... No, no, I mean the position, that is in the real space correlation function of positions still. Yeah, positions decay uh, in something that looks weird because you cannot define the, the, the positional correlation function. You have to go through the spectrum, which is what you see here, what you saw with the displacement field. Right. And bound order, I could show you, bound order is super Bound order is still, is still long. Super flat. Huh? Right. Yeah. I see. So, the, you know, you can go uh, local dynamics, uh, statistics of uh, how the pairs of dislocation unbind, et cetera, you could understand are governed by, are influenced by the activity, non-equilibriumness, whatever you want. And that's a local thing. As long as they stay bounded, the whole elastic picture can continue. If, if, if unbinding is prevented by something, then you can continue exploring further spin wave regimes, which is what you see in the XY case also. Jack, can yeah. you Did you try to change boundary conditions? So here we have no boundary conditions. The, the, the box has periodic boundary conditions perfectly adapted to the crystal that's key. In, we have been playing with crystals that have chirality and all that. So these are repulsive forces. So we, if we go to attractive forces, we can play with this. But we, so far, nothing to show. Some edge modes and things like that happen. Yes. Yes. Okay, so it might depend. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, at least for kappa zero, yes. uh, I mean, I have been told that, you know, you have these clusters of dislocations uh, hanging around even in the crystalline phase. You no. don't? Okay. I mean, in some cases, it could be, again, this is typically when the transition becomes uh, discontinuous. You have coexistence between, you know, and we, we do have cases where this happens. In okay. these simple cases, including ABPs with, with harmonic potential WCA, mm -hmm. you see just pairs of dislocations. Okay. Uh, but we have cases uh, where this happens, and then the transition is not uh, continuous, probably discontinuous, and you have coexistence of large clusters. Yeah. And uh, maybe you're referring of works where uh, there was strong alignment. Uh, there was an no, old paper I, by I was talking about Letitia's, uh, stuff. Yes, yes. No, I'm sorry. It's... Uh, to be revisited, let's say. Ah, okay. I mean, one offer is here. Where is uh, Ignacio? He's here hiding behind his screen, but. <laughs> Raman, last question. Yeah, so I'm fascinated by the K to the sixth uh, yes. contribution. It's so how a... are we to understand that 
<laughs> First of all, why is k to the fourth not there? Uh, if you are looking at some kind of Taylor expansion, uh, and is there any symmetry? I think this the alignment does this. I don't remember. I can show you a calculation. It's just a linear calculation, you know. And uh, I think without alignment, you get the k to a four, and with alignment, k to a six, and we see it. So you know, so. all this is well and then and fine within because it, it resides within linear elastic theory, and we have no reason. We're kind of lucky this way. We have other cases that we are looking at now. We also have cases where the crystal seems to be more fragile. And that bothers us. I mean, we try to understand this. And, that, and, and there we see um, probably that linear elastic theory is to be disposed of. And in this smooth, gentle, soft, or not so soft, but only pure repulsive cases, including some chiral cases, linear elastic theory works. That's why we can do all these things and understand things this way, but otherwise. Okay, so let's thank you for a very nice talk first.